name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forevermore. Amen. Please be seated. Well, a very um, warm welcome and a very good evening to all of you guys that are here. Tonight, my beloveds, we are talking about a topic called, Who is God? Now, well, even in Christians and non-Christians, uh, they always come up with this question, who is God? How do we follow God? Um, how do we understand God? And this question is always in the back of our heads, and it comes up every now and then, and we just sort of lose track of, well, who is really God to us? And to the rest of the world who, do not, who are not Christians, I believe at the end of the day there is only one mighty creator that has created the entire human race. Now whether those human race are Christians or Muslims or Buddhists or Hindus or atheists, they're all being created by someone. Oh, we need to know who is this someone. All right, so we're going to go. There are three questions that we're going to try to answer tonight by the power of the Holy Spirit with the grace of God. Uh, we're going to try to the best of our abilities to answer those questions. One is, who is God? Is He one or three? Two, what is the difference between the persons in the Trinity? And three, why salvation through incarnation and cross? Why did salvation have to come through incarnation and the Holy Cross. So we have quoted a few verses for you about who is this God? Is he really one or is he three? Which one is it? Okay, let's go. We're going to read from Exodus chapter 20 verses 1 and 2 and it says, And God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of of the house of bondage and God spoke all these words saying I am the Lord your God meaning I am meaning one this is one God is speaking let's go to the next verse Matthew 28 19 says go therefore and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We see there are three here. In Exodus, it says, I am the Lord God, one, singular. In Matthew, baptize him in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, three. Let's go to Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. St. Paul says, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one mighty God. Let's come first to the first concept of who is this God. Let me start with a few ideas. First of all, my beloved, God is an experience not a thought. God is an experience, not a thought. Now, what do I mean by that? For example, there are some people that want to follow God or want to understand God with their intellect, with their heads. Some people say, unless I see, unless I hear, unless I understand, you have to prove it to me, otherwise I'm not going to believe. Unless I understand, I'm not going to believe. So I say to people who have these kind of ideas and mentalities, my beloved, God is a, an experience, not a thought. Why? 
if I can contain, if I can contain anything in my head, in my thought, that means that my head and my thoughts are bigger than that thing. If I can put something in my head, that means my head is bigger than that thing, whatever it is. For example, if it's a mathematical equation, if I can solve that mathematical equation, I did that because my intellect is greater than that mathematical equation. And if that happens with God, then I am greater than God because I was able to contain God in my intellect, in my thinking. So, this God is smaller than my thinking. Therefore, I become God because I'm greater than Him. So therefore, and I'll say this um, a little story, how God answered this monk. This is a true story. There was this monk, he used to pray all his life, asking God to show him how he thinks. When he wants to do something, how does he go about doing those things? So one night, God spoke to him through a dream. Now, last night was the topic about dreams. He saw himself, this monk, walking on the beach. And he came to a nine-year-old boy sitting with a piece of stick in his hand, digging up a little hole in that sand, and with his little hand taking water from the ocean and pouring it into that little hole. Now the monk stopped and he said, My son, what are you doing? He said, Father, I want to empty the entire ocean into this little hole. Now the monk laughed. And he said, My son, you can't do that. But again, he realized that this is a little kid. That's all he understands. He said, It is impossible for you to empty the ocean into this little hole. And the little kid turned back to me and said, And isn't it impossible for you to put God in your head? Because my head is the little hole and God is the entire ocean. How can I fit the infinite God into this finite little tiny piece of dust called human being? So therefore, if I need to follow God, if I want to find out about God, I can't find Him out with my intellect because I'm a little hole and He is the endless ocean. A small drops in this little hole, once it's filled, you can't pour anymore. Once the glass is full of water, don't pour any more water in there because it's going to spill over. So therefore, how, how can we find out if God exists? Through experience in life. I'm sure all of us, all of us at some stage or another, have been through some dark tunnels in our lives. I'm sure all of us have come to a stage where it was a dead end wall. There was no further to go. And you probably, and more likely, waved the white flag, i.e. giving up. I give up, I can't do it anymore, this is too hard, it is impossible, I am dead meat. And out of nowhere, in a split second, some mighty hand intervenes and brings you out of that absolute dead end story into a bright, sunshiny day. How did that happen? It wasn't me. Because I could not focus anymore. I could not function anymore. My head stopped. So who did that? It wasn't my strength. It was the almighty God coming and pulling me out of that danger. So therefore, you want to know if God exists? Look back. Look back in your history and see how many times have you been brought out of absolute death out of the mouth of the lion. How many times have you been brought out of, you know, very, very dangerous situations where there was no solution intellectually? How many times? 
you need to understand that every time you've been brought out of that situation, it was God and no one but Him. Then therefore, God is not a thought. God is an experience in our lives. For one simple reason, I cannot contain God in my head. He is too big for me. I need to experience His presence, not use my head to find out about Him. Okay. Therefore, my beloved, God is one and three at the same time. You know the first three verses we read for you? In Exodus it says it's one Lord God. And then in Matthew 28, 19, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three. And in Ephesians it says one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. So is He really one? Or is he really three? No, he is one and three at the same time. Now we're going to cover all these. Why is God one? Well, when we talk about one, it is a singular number. Now this singular number, it, it, it means or actually it reflects or illustrates that God has no one to compare with. There is no comparison with number one. One stands alone. One stands by itself. I am the good shepherd and there is no one else but me. So that's why God is one because there is no one else you can compare him with. No one else. He stands alone. And why is he three? Because number three, my beloved, in the Arabic language and the Hebrew language is plural. In the Arabic language and the Hebrew language, number three, plural starts with number three. So number three represents plural, and plural represents mightiness, greatness, powerful. You know, when a president or a king of a country is given a talk or a speech, they don't say, I. They say, what? We are doing this. We are saying this. Well, is it, when you say we, is it, how many are you? You're only one. No, but... I represent the entire nation. I represent the entire nation. And when I talk, my, my word is very mighty, very powerful. No one else has the authority to change it except I, the king. My rank is too great for me to say I'm just one. We are. You understand? Are you with me so far? Good. Now let's look at... Um, Why is God one? Aspects of God. I'm going to give you two aspects why God is one and can't be more than one. One, He is infinite. Two, He is almighty. Now let's look at the infinite. Infinite means He has no beginning, no end. For example, if there was another God, just like we see in these other religions, they have so many gods. And you lose track of them. If we say that this God is one, and by the way, there are three religions that believe in this living God, and they, according to their religion, you know, the way of understanding, they say there is only one God, and that is the Christians, the Jewish, and the Muslims. They believe in their faiths that there is only one God. And some think about Christians when we say that we believe in Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They say you are believing in three gods. No, the one is three and the three are in one. But why do we believe as Christians as one living or one true living God? Because He is infinite. What is infinite? He has no beginning, no end. Now, if we say if there was another God, where would we put him? If this true God has no beginning and no end, where is the other one going to go? We all believe, even in the Jewish people and the Muslims, they say there is God fills everywhere and there is no place that God is not there present. God fills everywhere and there is no place that God is not present. He is present 
in all places at all times. He is omnipresent. He is omnipotent, almighty. So therefore, if God fills everywhere at the same time, well, there's got to be one God. So what am I going to put this other God if really exists? So therefore, there is no other God. It's only one. Secondly is the Almighty. Almighty means He is capable of anything and everything. Omnipotent. Capable of everything and anything. If there was another God, they would have fought over things. This is my territory. This is my property. And they would have fought. One of them would have won. But why do we see that God is one? Well, in the human beings. You bring an Aussie. You bring a Chinese. You bring uh, an Arabic person from the Middle East. You bring uh, South American. And you put them there. We all have two eyes, two ears, one head, two hands, two legs, same. And we all have the same blood. That just proves that the one who has created us is one. If there was more than one, they would have come up with different ideas. Because there are no two are the same. You bring two architects, they're going to design the house differently. Two different minds work in separate ways. But we see that this intellig intelligent God has created everything the same. If there was another God, would have said, hey, I don't like this human being with one head. I prefer two heads. <laughs> How about if we give him ten fingers instead of five on each hand? Because they would have argued. But when the mind is one, the heart is one, the thought becomes one. Example. Can there be two fathers in one house? Can there be? Imagine two fathers in one house. Who would you listen to? Or whose order or word would be you know, fulfilled? One says one thing, the other one says another thing, and the good old wife <laughs> erupts, and the children go in separate ways. So, just like there can't be two fathers in one house, so as there can't be more than one God that has created everything. My beloved, in, uh, in the time of Isaiah the prophet, now Isaiah the prophet was about uh, 700, some say about 7 to 800 BC, before Christ. Isaiah the prophet. At the time of Isaiah... At the time of Isaiah, the prophet, a religion came out called Zoroastrianism. Zoroastrianism. Zoroastrianism, this religion came out at the time of Isaiah the prophet. We called them Zaradusht. Or in our language, Assyrian, Zardushtai. According to their prophet, Zaradusht. Zoroastrianism came before, just before the 6th century B.C., before Christ. It was at the time of Isaiah the prophet. Now, what is this religion all about? They do believe in two things. They say that there are, in their faith, they believe in two gods. One is called Ahudra Mazda, and the other one Ahriman. Now, this religion came before the 6th century in the eastern part of ancient Iran, Persia. Iran is next to Iraq, Middle East. Iran is next to Iraq. You know the wise men in the book uh, in the New Testament where the wise men came from the east? They came from Persia, Iran. Now, this belief or this religion... They believe that there are two gods. One, Ahud, uh, Ahura, Ahura Mazda. Ahura Mazda, they believe that this god is good. But there is another one, Ahriman, is evil. So they say that there are two gods in this universe. One is good, 
Ahura Mazda, and Ahriman is evil. They fighting each other. Right? And whoever wins is going to rule. So if Ahura Mazda wins, humans are going to be good. Human race is going to be good. If Ahriman wins, the human race is going to be all evildoers. That is why at that time, some Jewish or Israelites people got influenced by this faith. Some Jewish or Israelites people who were believers of the true, divine, living God, they got influenced by this idea, which the devil actually invented. And they started saying, well, yes, maybe there is, or they do believe that there is an evil power called Satan. So they said, oh, yes, maybe there is another God called is an evil God. Maybe there is one. So the Israelites people started changing their ideas, some of them. That is why the true divine God gave them the answer, a concise answer in Isaiah 45, 45 verses 6, 6 to 7. I'll read them out to you. That they may know who are from the rising of the sun and they who are from the west, that there is none besides me. This is God talking. That there is none beside me. I am the Lord. And there is none else. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, that do all these things. Guys, there are some people misinterpret or misunderstand this verse where it says, I create, I make peace and create evil. This is God talking. How can God create, make peace and create evil? Does God create evil? No. We know our God is good. But this statement here says that God creates evil. Now, this was an answer to those Israelites people who were believing in Him and starting ch started changing their minds and following this uh, Zarudusht idea that, that there is another God who is an evil force. He said, no, I am the creator of all. I create evil, God here is referring to Satan, who, wa, who is God's creation, but he was not created in a, as an evil spirit. He was a good spirit, and actually one of the highest rank in the angelic order, cherubim. Satan was one of those angelic orders. But why? Because he did not listen to God, from good he became evil spirit. So he's saying, people, don't believe in this idea that there is another evil God. That evil God is Satan, and Satan is my creation, but I did not create him bad. I created him good. He didn't obey me. That's why he changed with his own will and became bad. But I am the Almighty, and there is none else but me. I am the ruler over all authorities. I am supreme, one God, singular, none like me. Okay. Well, we said that God is one. But you Christians, why do you come back after you say that God is one, and as Christians we believe that God is one, then you come back and say He's three. Well, make up your mind, you Christians. Is He one or is He three? No, He is one in three and three in one. Then why do we say that God is three? Let's go. God is one in three. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Don't we say that? Don't we believe in that? In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Amen. Who is the Father? Who is the Son? And who is the Holy Spirit? Well, Father here means essence. What is essence? The word I am. What is I am? Existence. Father means essence. Essence is the word me. I am. What is I am? I exist. I am. I'm a being. I exist. So, when we say about the Holy Trinity, the Father, we mean existence. 
I am. When we say the sun, the sun here means intellect, i.e. the thought. When we say Holy Spirit, we say life, i.e. love. L-O-V-E. God exists. God is wise, intellectual. He has the thought. And God is love, who is life. So when we say we believe in the Father who exists, we believe in this God who is the existence, who is the wise, and who is all life and love. The formula, the formula, formula of God being one in three is like this. One times one times one equals one. Three circles interwoven into each other. One times one times one equals one. One into one into one equals one. It is not one plus one plus one. Because when you put one plus one, that means this one is an individual separate to the other one, separate to the other one, therefore they become three gods. No. We say they are into each other. God, the Almighty, exists. This God who exists is wise. This God who exists and is wise is alive, is love. One times one times one equals one God. What are the tasks of each one of these? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Task of these three. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Well, okay, we said essence is the Father. What is the essence? I am existence. I make decisions. So the essence, I, I am, I make decisions. Two, example of that, I decided to solve a mathematical formula. I looked at someone and I said to myself, not what a wonderful world, but I like this person. Aha, uh -huh. well, who gave you that decision? Me. My existence gave me that decision to say, I like this person or I don't like this person. I decided. My existence gave me that decision making. So as an essence, I make decision. So, the essence, I am, make decision. The intellect solves that formula. And the spirit drew me near or attracted me to this formula. When you're studying or when you're trying to solve this formula, my existence gave me the decision to grab this formula. My intellect solved this formula. But what Drew, drew my attention to it. What attracted me to it? My spirit. Now, what did we say the spirit is? Life. Love. Huh? So, through my spirit, I love this person. Through my intellect, I want to get to know this person. And through me, my existence, I decided to like this person. My existence decided to like this person. My intellect, uh, through my decision, want to know more about this person and my life my love my spirit wants to share maybe a lifetime with this person okay my beloved if we say that god is only one and one only as some other religions they say that those who believe in the true god they say there's only one god there's no other one Three can't be. That is blasphemy. Well, if God is only one, then we've got a problem. One of the main problems, we've got a lot of problems with this, but I'm going to tell you one main problem with this. If God is only one and one only, can't be three and one and one and three. If they don't want to accept this, then we've got an issue. Why? The main one, God does not change. My beloveds, as Christians, I can talk to you about the Holy Trinity and you're probably going to accept it because you believe in the same faith that I believe in.
But imagine I'm talking to an atheist. Hmm? I'm talking to an atheist and I want to prove something to that atheist or to try and get it through their way of thinking, get the message across. Now an atheist would say, if God really exists, who was he talking with when he really existed? If God really exists, who was he talking with when he really existed? Now this question, those religions who believe in God, they won't be able to answer it, Jewish and Muslims, they won't. Because they say there's only one God and God be more than one. So an atheist comes to you and say, if God really existed, who was he talking with? He was alone. And you guys are saying God is one. So by himself, who was he talking with? If you're going to say he wasn't talking with no one, then when the language came and God spoke, then it looks like he did not have this language before. And now language came, so there is now a change in God's aspect. He was one thing, and now he is something else. Before he couldn't talk, and now he can talk. Well, a change happened in God, and God is the Almighty, cannot change. God never changes. And that is in the faith of all religions that believe in the mighty God. They believe that God never changes. So who was he talking with when he was alone? And you say, guys, he's one. I'll explain it to you why. What I mean by here. Let's go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. The very, the very Bible, the very beginning of the Holy Bible, which the Jewish people, the Muslims and the Christians believe in, the Old Testament, the Torah, we read the same. Jewish, Muslims, Christians. We read the same book. Okay. In the very beginning says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1.1. Stop there, Eddie. God created... The word God here... The word God here is not the proper translation of the original text. Now, my beloved, if you don't know this, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. Hebrew comes from Aramaic. Aramaic Assyrians speak it. Suryoyo. Hmm? That's the Lord's language. So the Hebrew language was the original text of the Old Testament. If you go to the Hebrew language, Genesis 1.1, it says, In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. Aluhim. Oh. Now, is there a difference between Aluhim and God? Yeah. You see, translations does not give you the 100% picture. And it can't. Every translation will fall short here and there. But it's the same concept. It talks about God. Aluhim is God, but with a difference. God stands alone, one God. But Elohim is three in one. Elohim is plural, gods. Ah. So when we go back to the original text, we will understand it more. See, God, the Almighty who is one, in the very beginning showed himself as I am three in one. I am one with three persons in me. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. Now, as we said, singular, when we multiply the single, it refers magnification. We are magnifying this God. He's saying we're mighty. When someone says, we are the President of the United States of America, we, it gives you that power, that authority, that mightiness, yeah? So, a, an, a multiplication of a one is magnification. Gives you that mightiness, strength. So now in the beginning, God shows that I'm three in one. Elohim is plural, three in one. Now let's go and see if this God is really one or one in three. Look at this. In Genesis 1 verse 3, 
It says, then God said, let there be light. And there was light, Genesis 1, 3, again. And God saw the light that it was good, Genesis 1, verse 4. Look at this, guys. We said in here, God is one, but he's three in one. He's showing himself that. Christians have not invented this idea of three in one. God himself showed it. Then God said, uh -huh. let there be light. And light came about. Then God created the light. Then God saw that the light was good. Uh -huh. So we see God said, God created, God saw. God said, what did he say? Who was he talking to? Who was he talking to? If God is only one, and one only, who are you going to talk to? You know, if I come to you and I say, what were you doing in the room? I was talking to myself. I'll try and make it more simpler. This is deep theology, by the way. Very deep theology. Now, you're going to say, I was talking to myself. We say, oh, well, I'm going to say, if you're just one, you are a lunatic. Only lunatics to talk to themselves. Who were you talking with? Myself. Are you just one? No. I'm three in one. You cannot talk to yourself unless you, one, exist. Two, intelligent. Three, alive. How can you talk to yourself unless you can't exist? You are not intelligent and you are not alive. You can't talk to yourself unless these three are in you. That is why God created us in His image and likeness. God is one in three and three in one. He created the human race to teach us through this simple creation what God is all about. He created us like Himself. We are three in one. I exist. I am intelligent. I have brains. And I'm alive. So in order for me to talk to myself, I have to exist. I have to be smart. I have to have a brain. Right? Otherwise, how can you talk without a brain? And I have to be alive. True or not? Yes? Are you with me? So God can't be just one. He has to be three in one. These three are fundamental, essential aspects of God's existence or of God's nature. God's nature is existence, intelligence, and life. So I cannot fix any mathematical formulas unless I exist and use my head and I am alive. I can't fix that formula. If I don't have a brain, even if I'm alive and I don't have a brain, can I do that formula? Can I get a result? Who gets the result? My existence? No. My, my life? No. My intelligence. Is my intelligence my existence? No. Is existence my life? No. None of them are the same. But three are one being. You take one out, I can't call you a human being anymore. Just like the sun, S-U-N. You know the sun that rises? The sun is the three in one and one in three. The sun is round. The shape is round. The sun gives light and gives heat. Round, light, heat. Three in one. But it's one sun. It's not three suns. It's one sun. If I take the light out of it, it's no longer sun. If I take the heat out of it, it's no longer sun. If I take the round shape, it's no longer the sun. I know this one sun by the shape, by the light, by the heat, but it's one sun. I don't see three suns rising. It's one sun. Human being exists, has a brain, and is alive, but it's one human being. Okay, so we've seen here that God said, so God is intelligent. Where do we get the word from? From the head, the brain. Without a brain, I don't have any words to say, true or not. I don't have any words to say. So when God said, uh huh, so he had words, he had a language, so he wasn't talking just to himself, he's not just one God. God was talking to his brain. 
So the existence talked to the intelligence through the life. Father exists. Son, intellect. intellect. So the Father existence spoke to the intellect, the Son, through the Holy Spirit, the life of this one divine God. In Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, we said God, who is Elohim, in the original text of the Hebrew, which is three in one. So this is one mighty God, who is three in one. We will see that in Genesis 1.3, God said, the essence decided, the existence, I am. Who makes the de decision? The existence, me, I make the decision. I decided to speak. So the existence decided. God said the existence. The Father spoke. Then Genesis 1.3 Let there be light. God said let there be light. So who created? God created the intellect. Who created? The Son. The Father, the existence. The decision maker. Decided to speak. Through his brain. Who is the brain? The Son of God. The Son created. Let there be light. And light came about. And when the light came about, through the Son, who is the intelligence, everything is created by the Son. That's why when we brought God's Word, the Son came in the womb of the Holy Mother to save us. Now, in Genesis 1-4, God saw that the light was good, the Spirit saw and declared the love of God in all of His creations. What is the Spirit? Life. What is life? Love. God decided through His love to create through His intelligence and give life to all creations. The existence, the Father decided to create through the intellect, the Son, by the power of the Holy Spirit, the life giver. Three in one. Are you with me so far? God said, God created, God saw. Already He is showing us that I'm three in one. I said, I created, and I saw. Three in one. Who said? The Father. Who created? The Son. Who saw? The Holy Spirit. Father created everything through the Son by the power of the Holy Spirit. I know it is a theological topic, but it's a good one. Now let's go. Look at this. In Isaiah, now by the way, the prophet Isaiah is referred to as the fifth gospel. You know, in the New Testament... We have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Four Gospels. Theologians and scholars, they say that Isaiah, we can call him the fifth Gospel. Now, Isaiah is in the Old Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are in the New Testament, 700 years after Isaiah. But why do they refer to him as the fifth Gospel? Because the book of Isaiah describes the birth of the Lord Jesus the deeds of the Lord Jesus, everything, so precisely, so in very deep details, as if Isaiah was walking along or beside Jesus Christ. That's why they call him the fifth gospel. Now look in the Isaiah. It says, And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. In Isaiah 6.3, says these cher uh, seraphims, these angels, were calling or crying out to one another and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy. Who are they saying to? Holy, Holy, Holy. They're saying it to God. But why are they saying it three times? Holy, Holy, Holy. Why? Well, if God is only one, they would have said, Holy is God Almighty, and that's it. Finish it off. Why are they saying it three times? Holy, Holy. Holy, holy. Because who is the first holy? Who is the second holy? And who is the third holy that they are saying it three times to? We'll find that out in 
The first one is in John, the New Testament. My beloved, the old and the new are one holy book. One holy book. Look at this, John. Gospel of John in the New Testament, chapter 17, verse 11. Jesus Christ himself is declaring the first holy. Who is the first holy? Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. Holy Father. So who is the first holy? The Father. We believe in the Holy Trinity. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And the angels in the Old Testament, they're crying out to God, Holy, 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 i.e. Holy the Father, Holy the Son, Holy the Holy Spirit. Now the first holy is the Father, John 17, 11. What is the second holy? Gabriel angel, uh, the angel Gabriel declares that to Mother Mary. Now we're having the face of the Holy Mother. The angel Gabriel comes to this beautiful girl, about 14 years old, in Nazareth of Galilee, and Nazareth in, um, in Israel, Middle East. And look what Gabriel angel, uh, the angel Gabriel says to the Queen of Heaven, Mother Mary. And the angel answered and said to her, to Mother Mary, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also, that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. The Holy One who is to be born of you will be called the Son of God. So who is the second Holy? The Son of God. The first Holy is the Father. The second Holy is the Son. And the third Holy is in Matthew 28, 19. Go therefore, Jesus is saying here, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And the angels were crying, Holy, 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 Father, Son, Holy Spirit are the three holies. And look at this, baptizing them in the name, not names. It's not plural, it's singular. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Baptizing them in the name of the Father times the Son times the Holy Spirit, one God. In the name, singular, one God. They are one almighty God. Now, the next one is an answer to Jehovah's Witnesses. Have you heard of Jehovah's Witnesses? I don't want to mention other religions, but I will mention Jehovah's Witnesses because they talk about Jesus, but they have nothing to do with Jesus Christ. Absolutely none, including the Mormons. They are not Christians at all. I love them, I pray for them, but I cannot accept them in the name of Jesus Christ never ever in the whole world because their Bible is changed. They have been delusionized by the devil. They have veered off the path of Jesus. Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons better come back to their senses and seek the truth for the truth sets them free. And the truth is Christ the Messiah, the Almighty God in the flesh. Now, is the Holy Spirit power? Is this Spirit, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, because Jehovah's Witnesses, they say that the Holy Spirit is the power of God. No, my dear, the Holy Spirit is God Himself. It's not the power of God. Like, it's a power comes out of God, therefore God is greater than the Holy Spirit. No such thing. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one true divine God. They say that the Holy Spirit is power. Is the Holy Spirit power? The answer is absolutely no. And I will give you a very concise answer from the Bible straight in the face. Look at this. Well, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, it says, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters, or the surface of the waters. Now let's go to John 4, 24. And this one hits it right in the, in the, in the head. God is what? Spirit. 
Now in Genesis 1-2, it says, The Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. The Spirit of God. And then in John 4.24 says, God is Spirit. So what is the Holy Spirit? God is not the power of God. It's God Himself. Now this is the answer to all those who believe in this kind of um, wrong ideas called Jehovah's Witnesses. Question two, what is the difference between the persons in the Trinity? Now, we said that the this one God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Three in one. Now, what is the difference between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Well, the difference is very, very uh, quickly. Very quickly. Head it, uh, um, Eddie. Father is creator. Created all in the Son, in the Holy Spirit. Son is the Redeemer. Who redeemed us? Who saved us? Who delivered us? The Son, not the Father. The Son. The Son is the Redeemer. He redeemed us in the Father and the Holy Spirit. So they're all working together. It's three dynamics working together in absolute perfection. The Father created us. When we fell, the Son redeemed us in the Father and the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the carrier of that redemption. Whatever Jesus has done, He carried that salvation to us in the by the order of the Father and taking from the Son. Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes, He will take from me and give to you. What did the Holy Spirit take from Jesus and give us? Salvation, the body and blood. It's another topic, my beloved. Uh, we need to talk about these things. Why the body and the blood are absolute foundation, nourishment, and, and, and revival of your body and, and soul. Absolute foundation. It's not symbolic, as some Christians say, bread and wine. No, it's true body and true blood. The Holy Spirit takes from Jesus that salvation, which is His true body and true blood, gives it to all of us, and when we take it in faith, we are saved. When we take it in faith, we are saved. Let's go further. Question three was, why salvation came through incarnation and cross? The question one was, who is God? Is He one or three? We answered that. Question two was, what was the difference between the three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and, the, and, and this one God? We said, Father is the Creator, Son is the Redeemer, Holy Spirit is the carrier of that redemption to all mankind who believe in this Lamb of God, uh, hanged on the cross, Jesus Christ. Now question three is why salvation had to come through incarnation and the cross? Now, why did God have to become a human being? Why? Why couldn't He, that when we made a mistake and we just went to Him and said, God, please forgive me, and He would have done it from His heaven. Why did He have to go through all the hassle and the bustle and come down and be a human being like us? And why the cross? Why did God have to come and become a human? And why the cross? God is all. And the word all. God is all love, all mercy, all justice. Three foundational aspects in the almighty God. God is all love is all mercy, is all justice. None of these three are greater than the other one. That, that means God's love is not bigger than His mercy, is not bigger than His justice, and vice versa. They are all one equal. And we said God is infinite. That means there is no room for this one, for this one, for this one. God is all love, no beginning, no end love. God is all mercy, no beginning, no end mercy. God is all justice, no beginning, no end justice. They're all as equal as each other. Why did God create us? Because He loves us. But this Creator who is love, is also merciful, is also just. Now in the, in the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis, well, God said to Adam, 
He says, Adam, if you eat from this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, surely you shall die. Now he said, God never changes. So God doesn't say one word and then he says, oops, uh, I'm going to change my mind now. Sorry, I didn't know. God is all knowledge. So he knows what he's talking about. So when he says something, he's not going to go back on his word. We do because we don't know everything. We promise, but we don't deliver always, do we? Because we don't know everything. And so many times we say like to the ones we love, you know, a boy and a girl, I love you to death. Why you do gluch papi? Ash on your head, padma breishuk. I love you to death, and when death comes, I run away. Hello, but you promised me that you're gonna die for me. In your dreams, baby. <laughs> it was just a word I said. This promise is greater than me. I can't deliver. I can't deliver. But God is almighty. What he says, he does. Because he says and does, he is capable of everything and anything. So what is impossible to mankind is very, very possible to the almighty God. Now, God is love. God is mercy. God is justice. He created us on the basis of love, through justice, by his mercy. If someone comes and says to us, well, you know, God is merciful. Every time I make a mistake, I just run to him and I say, God, I'm sorry. And because God is merciful, um, he's just going to forgive me. He's really nice, you know, he's cool. So when I say sorry and, and shed a couple of tears, he's going to really, that's going to break his heart and he's going to feel really sorry for me. And he say, I forgive you, I forgive you. But if God does that through his mercy and forgives me, he is breaking his justice. He is going against his justice. What is justice? If you make a mistake, you will die. Now God is not going to change his word. God is not going to change his word. And if he's going to sentence me to death, then he's going to go against his mercy and love. Where is your love, God? How could you allow me how, how could you let me go to death, to hell? You created me. You better save me. So it's a problem. It's a problem. If God judges me, if God forgives me, just like that, He's breaking His justice. And if God sentenced me to death, He's breaking His mercy and love. When you love someone and you show compassion on that someone, would you be harsh on them? Of course not. Love is always kind. Love is never harsh. So if, if God sentenced me to death, He's breaking His love and His mercy. And if God forgives me just like that, He's breaking His justice. The wage of sin is death. Right? That is why, for those people who say, I make a mistake and I just go to God and I say, I'm sorry, God is the all-merciful, compassionate God. He's just going to forgive me. Sorry, my sweetheart. He is breaking his justice because the wage of sin is death. For his justice, for God's justice to be fulfilled, I have to die. Full stop. I have to die. Full stop. And if I die, then where is God's love and mercy? You're very harsh, God. You just let me go to my hell. So God has got a problem. Well, not really. What is impossible to mankind is possible to the Almighty God. I'll tell you two stories in the Bible. Now listen to this. One is in the Old Testament in the book of Daniel. In the book of Daniel, there was this king, a Persian king, Persia and Medes or Medes. His, called, uh, his name was called Darius. Some Jewish people very sneaky, those ones. They came to him and he said, King, for the next whole month, we want you to send a decree, an order, to say to all the people that are living under your control that I, Darius the king, or the emperor, I'm going to be your God. For the next month, I'm your God. You pray, you pray to me. 
you ask of something, you ask of me. I'm your God. Now, Darius said, whoa, that's a good idea. I'm going to be God. Wow, that's mighty. So he sent a decree. And in, the, in, the, in their law, the Persians, in their law, it was written that if the decree is sent and then the king changes his mind, he will be, he has to die. He has to go. There is no coming back. Why did these people do that? Now, Darius was very simple here. He didn't think deeply because they hated Daniel. Those Jewish people hated Daniel. Now, Daniel was a Jew too. Now, when the decree was sent, which the king can't go back on his word, Daniel, the word came to him that he has to worship Darius. He went out, he went on, onto the roof, opened the windows of his room, and with a loud voice, he faced Jerusalem and start praying to his God, the living God, the God of the Israelite nation. The people heard him praying to Almighty God, but the decree said you have to pray to Darius because he's going to be God for the next month. Now the word came to Darius. They said, Daniel has just broken your word. Now Darius the king loved, loved Daniel to death. When he heard that Daniel broke his word, he felt so sorry because you know what that meant? It's either between him or Daniel. If he does not punish Daniel, the king has to die. And if the king has to live, then Daniel has to die. That is the law. There is no comeback. He called Daniel. He said, Daniel, for as much as I love you, but I can't die for you. He fell short. Our love for one another falls very short when it comes to the push and shove, huh? to the real stuff. So he said, for as much as I love you, Daniel, but I can't die for you, therefore, the God of your people, let him, whom you worship, let him deliver you from the mouths of the lions. They threw Daniel in the den of the lions, in a, in a, in a cave full of lions. And that night, all night long, Darius the king can't sleep because he loves Daniel. He says, he's thinking, what is happening to Daniel now? Maybe the lions have ripped him apart. There's probably only bones left of him in the morning. He gets up early morning. He hasn't slept all night long because he loves Daniel. He goes with a very sad, the Bible says, the very sad tone of voice. Daniel, where are you? I hope you're still alive. He said, my God, my living God, send his angel and shut the mouths of the lions. I am alive, King Darius. Don't you worry. Darius, that's the Old Testament. In the New Testament, look at the other person. Now, this other person is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Jesus Christ of Nazareth, God, Darius, man. Look at the difference between God and man when it comes to true love. Men fall very short, but look at Jesus of Nazareth. My goodness. They put Jesus in a very awkward situation. What was that? They brought to the Lord Jesus while he was in the outer court of the temple, outside, in the, in the uh, outside of the temple, similar to the church in the Old Testament, temple of King Solomon. He was out in the, in the outside of the temple. They brought to him a woman. Uh, they caught this woman in the very act. Now, in the very act, means she was pregnant out of wedlock. You know what I mean. This woman was held in the very act, meaning she was pregnant out of wedlock. Not married, but pregnant. They didn't, have any, they didn't need any witnesses because her tummy was the witness that she has done something wrong. Now, 
the Jewish law for a girl who is not married to be pregnant has to be stoned to death. That is the law. Now, Jesus Christ came to fulfill the law of God. Now look, look how this sneaky devil does things. They brought this woman to Jesus. And they said, this woman has been caught in the very act. She is not married, but pregnant. Look at the tummy, showing. She has to be stoned to death. What do you say, Jesus? Oops. Now Jesus has got a problem. If Jesus says, don't stone her because he is love, then they're going to say, you are breaking the law of God, justice. Because God's law, justice, says a woman like this has to be stoned to death. So if he says, don't stone her out of his love and mercy, he is breaking the law of God. And if he breaks the law of God, then he has to be stoned. Then he has to be stoned. He has to die. If I let go of the woman, I have to die. And if I say stone her, which I do say stone her, because the law says a woman like this has to be stoned. And Jesus came to do the will of the law, everything that is written in the law. So he says, yes, do stone her. But, look at Jesus. But if there is anyone, he said to those people that were holding stones in their hands to stone this woman, he said, yes, I agree with you. She needs to be stoned. But if any one of you is without sin, let him stone this woman first. And the Bible says that everyone threw their stones from their hands, from the oldest to the youngest, and walked away. Why? Because they were all sinners like this woman. He said, yeah, I agree with you. She has to be stoned. But if there is anyone in you without sin, let him or her stone this woman. They walked away. Then Jesus was left, or this woman was left alone with Jesus. Jesus looks at her. He says, where are all the ones who wanted to stone you? Do you see them? She said, no. He said, neither do I see your sins. Go away and don't sin again. Now, what did Jesus do here? He didn't break the law of God. He, she has to be stoned. But anyone in you with that sin, stone her. They walked away because they're all sinners. Who was left with her? Jesus, the one without sin. Now, Jesus is the one who should stone this woman. Jesus is the one who should and has the full right to stone this woman because he is the only human being that is without sin. But look at Jesus. He says, go away, woman, in peace. And don't do that again. Now, as those people threw the stones in that yard of the temple, now, the yard got filled with stones, right? In the very chapter, they took those stones to stone Jesus. Why? Because he said to them, Before Abraham was, I am. He said, Before Abraham was, I am. They said, You are a blasphemer. Why? Because you are making yourself as equal to God. I am means, in the Greek text, Jehovah, Yahuwah, the Almighty God, I am that I am. He said, they said to him, you are making yourself equal to God, therefore we have to stone you. But Jesus walked away from them because his time had not come. But he, this woman whom Jesus set free, who broke the law, he set her free on the account that Jesus got broken on the cross on her behalf. She broke God's law and she had to be stoned. Jesus let her go and he took the punishment on himself and got broken instead. He got stoned, if you know what I mean. So here, what do we see? 
Jesus dying on the cross is the fulfillment of the justice of God. Why incarnation? We said, why did God have to come, become a human being and why the cross? Why these two? Well, one, when we make mistakes, the law of God says that we have to die. Or, gives us two choices. Or, someone else must die in my, in my place. That's the law of God. When I make a mistake, I have to die. If I am to let go and set free, someone else has to take my place. Jesus came, the Almighty God in the flesh, took my place, took this human being on and died in my place so that I can be free. Why is Jesus God and can't be anything else? Now pay attention guys. Some people think that God is bigger than Jesus Christ. Now Jesus Christ is the almighty God in the flesh. That's it. Jesus Christ can't be a good prophet, can't be a holy man, can't be someone intelligent. He's either God or he's nothing. He's either God or absolutely nothing. For one simple reason. I will illustrate this simple reason for you in a kindergarten level, with all due respect to all of you, because I want to make it as simple as possible, this deep theology. Very simple. Okay. Here we go. This is why Jesus is God and can't be anything else. Are you paying attention? Good. Let's say, far from all these three beautiful uh, men here, let's say I come to this little boy and I smack him in the face. Right? I go smack. He cries. And then I take out a lolly and I say, Gulu, 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 gulu. And then with this lolly, he forgets the smack and he loves me to death. My punishment, I got away with it with a lolly. The same very smack. Elbrin is a police officer, let's assume. I come and smack the police officer. It's the same smack. And then I go to the police officer. He's a lolly for you, officer. Gulu, gulu, gulu. Do you think he's going to accept my, uh, my lolly and the guji guji? He's going to put me in the cage, not the guji guji, in the cage, straight to the police station. Locked away, brother. Now, Rami is Barack Obama, president of America. I come, same smack. I come to smack Barack Obama, Rami. Before my hand gets to his face, I am dead meat, gone without a trace or trail. It's a very same smack. Little boy, lolly, fixed it. Officer, police station, president, dead meat. Same smack. What happened? Why? Aha. Uh -huh. Because my punishment is measured, listen to this carefully, my punishment is measured according to the rank I have offended. My punishment is measured according to the rank I have offended. I offended a little kid rank. Lolly fixed it. I offended a police officer. The police station and the jail fixed it. I offended the presidency rank. I am dead. When I make a mistake, who am I offending? Whose rank am I offending? God the Almighty. The wage of sin is death. When I'm making a mistake, I'm going against God. I'm smacking God. If I could use this, illustra you know, this word. God's rank is infinite. No beginning, no end. God is infinite. When I'm offending God by, mistake, by my mistakes, my mistake becomes infinite. No beginning, no end. Who can take away this mistake that is greater than any prophet, greater than any angel, greater than any good person? The only one 
who can take away this mistake is the infinite God Himself. That is why God had to come and become human like us. So that through humanity delivers the human race by the power of His divinity which is infinite. And take away the infinite mistake of the human race. Because I offended God who is infinite. So Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. Now why the cross? To finish it off. My beloved, because the human race fell free will, using their free will, it was their choice to fall and break God's word. God gave every one of us a choice. God gave Adam a choice. He says, eat from all these trees, but don't, don't eat from this tree. Adam ate from that tree which God forbade him to eat from. So it was Adam's choice and Eve, through Eve, that their choice to eat from the tree. So because, because the human fell freely using their free will, God had to bring Adam and all human race back with the devil's will. God had to bring all of us back using the devil's will. Now what do I mean by that? Does the devil, well, the human race listen to the devil. And the devil's will was to deceive the human race and lead them into absolute eternal death. So the devil's will was to lead everyone to destruction. And the human race listened freely to the devil and broke God's word who is all love. So Jesus Christ came to bring us all back using the devil's will. Now does the devil want to let go of us? Of course not. But Jesus forced the devil in a very nice way without him realizing it and he gave us all back to him. How? Now, the, listen, listen to this very carefully, guys. The devil will not come directly and say to you, do this. He will come in directly. When the devil came to deceive Adam and Eve, he didn't come by himself and, and do that. He went and sneaked in the snake. He hid himself in the snake and came to Adam and Eve and deceived them. He comes indirectly. He doesn't come to you and say, go and steal. But what, he, what will he do? He says, do you really want this? Of course. Well, he can't get it unless you go and get this. Unless you go and steal. So he's going to come in directly. He's going to show something that really grabs your attention. He's going to bring something your way that you really desire and love the most. And then he says, if you really want this and you are dying to get this, then the only option you've got, my dear child, is not, is, well, he doesn't say that. He says, you better go and steal so that you can buy this Ferrari. Being on Centerlink, you can't get this Ferrari. Working in Woolies, no way in the world he can save for a Ferrari. But I love a Ferrari. And the devil is going to bring this idea Ferrari, 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 and he say, yes, I have to get this Ferrari. He's going to put it right in you. And then he's going to say, well, I've got no choice but to sell drugs so I can buy the Ferrari, to go and steal so I can buy the Ferrari, to go and break into this car and steal it away. That's the devil. But he's not going to come directly to you and say, go and steal that Ferrari. He's going to give you something nice. What was that something nice that he gave to Adam and Eve? He says, if you eat from this tree which God says don't eat from, you're going to be like God. Whoa. Just like Darius. Great idea. I'm like God. That feels good. Power. Why do young boys, especially men, run after mullah and drugs and fast cars? Because it, it empowers them. Money empowers you. If I get money, I can have a very fast Ferrari or a V8. But why do we chase after money? Because money brings us the things that we want. 
And by working at Woolies and doing this, no way in the world I'm going to be able to do the things that I want. I want a fast car so I can be a show off. It gives me power. So the devil puts this idea in your head that you feel that you have the power. And then you go and do it. You don't worry about what the circumstances are going to be because all you care about which the devil put this idea in your head that, yeah, I see myself driving that V8 supercharged car and everybody's watching and looking at me and I'm being a show-off. So just like the devil sneaked in the snake to come and deceive us, so as God said to the devil, I will come and sneak in the human body and save the human race from you. And why the cross? Because everything happened. What is the cross? Wood. What does wood here represent? Tree. What happened in the Garden of Eden? How did the human race fall? Because they ate from the tree. So the battle between God hidden in the human and the devil and the snake had to take place at the tree. But this time it is the tree of the cross. Adam grabbed, stretched his arm to grab the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which God said, don't eat. Adam stretched, the first Adam, stretched his arm to eat from that tree. The latter Adam, the last Adam, Jesus Christ, stretched his arm to be nailed on the very same tree. The first Adam stretched his arm to break God's word. The last Adam stretched his arm to fulfill God's word. The first Adam, when he ate from the tree, saw himself naked. He hid behind the tree because he was embarrassed. The first Adam went up on the tree fully naked to dress and cover the nakedness of the first Adam. That is why there had to be the cross, the tree. Because it was the tree that made everyone fall in the first Adam, but in the last Adam's Jesus, it was the very tree, the holy cross, that delivered all mankind who believed in the sacrificial lamb of God, Jesus Christ. I'll finish off on this. In the Mid-Ages, um, there was a Japanese emperor called Digwa. He was a Japanese <laughs> emperor. <laughs> this Japanese emperor in the mid-centuries, he was an emperor. One day, one person went and he saw at their court courthouse uh, a, a man with one eye you know in every in every courthouse there's a symbol he thought it was a symbol a man with one eye you know you, you see like a scale which is symbolic on the courthouse saying here we judge people you know we weigh him who is good who is bad and we judge him accordingly so that scale is symbolic for justice now this courthouse didn't have a scale had this man with one eye so this guy asked, he said, what is this representing? Is this symbolic, this symbol? They, they said, the Japanese people said to, to this man, they said, this is not a symbol. This is a real emperor in the mid, uh, mid ages. Uh, what happened at that time? He said that this emperor was the fairest emperor in the entire uh, Japanese nation. What did this emperor do? He, he gave out a law or set out a decree that if anybody commits adultery, if anybody commits adultery, they will have to pluck their do both eyes out. That was the law at the time of this emperor, Digwa. He says anyone, including himself, if he gets caught committing adultery, both eyes have to, be co have to come out. 
Not even a month later, they caught his only son, the heir to the throne, the next emperor. They caught him in this act and they brought him to the emperor, his only son, his only son. Now the law is, his both eyes have to come out. He, Digo was an old man, his son is going to take his place. If he pulls his, bo his son's both eyes, he can't rule the nation without eyes. He can't go back on the word. The law is set. The best that he could come up with, this Digwa emperor, he said, okay, the law says you need two eyes to be pulled out. Yes? Yes. Okay. He says, you pull one eye of my son and one from me. Because he has to be punished. He was caught in, in that act. He has to be punished. So he said, okay, you want two eyes? Fine. You take one of my son and one of mine. That way, at least he's got one, son left, one eye left. He can rule after me. So this emperor, in his mightiness, could come up with this solution, 50-50. God, the Almighty, has one begotten son for the salvation of all his children, the human race, he didn't come halfway and he says 50-50, okay, you guys have made a mistake. All right, my son is going to take half of your mistakes and you, get, you, you deal with the rest. He says, no, not only that my son's eyes are going to be, be pulled out, but his entire body is going to be ripped apart for the salvation of all of you. This is true love that goes all the way, never falls short. I'll sum it up on this and I'll finish it off on this, relationships. Now, which relationship would you want to put number one in your life? People or Christ? People who fall short or Christ who died for you willingly happily who do you want to build a relationship with first and utmost the answer I'll leave it to you to think about and decide in your existence using your intellect using the life which is love which you are being created on that basis of love but if you want to live, just like the Holy Bible says, the Lord God said, I have put two ways before you, mankind. One is life and one is death. If you choose death, then you will die. And if you choose life, then you will live. And I put before you my son and the devil. I put the light and the darkness. You choose the light, you choose my son, you choose eternal life. You choose the darkness. You choose the devil. You choose eternal death. The choice is yours. Do you want to live for the one who died for you? Or do you want to die for the one who killed you? This Jesus Christ, the Almighty God, came through this virgin called Mary of Nazareth. She was about 14, 15 years old. A little tiny flower blossoming. 14, 15 years old. 2,000 years and odd before. Imagine angel of God who stands in the presence of the Almighty God. Imagine if an angel comes and appears before a 15-year-old girl. I think out of fear she'll just collapse and dies. Angels are very powerful, by the way, very powerful. This angel of God appears before this little tiny flower. And he says, Mary, yes angel, the Almighty God has chosen you and he wants to come in your little womb and become a man and saves the world. She says, 
let it be his will or your will according to you and not mine what kind of what kind of decision she made what kind of faith she had what kind of powerful love a 15 year old kid back then in a very difficult society that females are not allowed to go and study and become educated so the so her knowledge was very limited but her faith was unshakable 15 year old kid she said let it be god's will not my will she chose God the Almighty over everything she, that she would desire to do. Any girl wishes to get married. Any girl wishes to have a family and children. Mother Mary cared nothing about this. All she cared about that I want my Heavenly Father to be happy and do His will in me as He pleases, not as I please. Let us learn from the Queen of Heaven obedience my beloved when our parents tell us something we should not get angry and upset and go against them let us be obedient to their will and their wish just like Mary was obedient to her Heavenly Father she chose life that's why she is the living Queen of heaven now how many females came like Mary? Do we remember them? Do we know them? We don't even know if they existed. But there was a lot of females at her time. Who cares? Where are they? Gone. But look at Mary. 2,000 years later, much stronger she is going. Much more powerful she is flying through the universe and the heavens. Isn't that the gift of God for her how many churches in the world are after her name 2,000 years later my goodness I forget I met someone the other day I forget 2,000 years I've never seen Mother Mary why do I have this love for her why that's not me that's the proof very right before your eyes it's a proof that God the one we serve is the living God and because she chose this true living God, that's why she is the living Queen of Heaven, Mother Mary. She's alive. She's not dead. She's not history. She's present always. Because the mighty God we serve is present tense. I am that I am is a continuous present tense. And whoever believes in Him and walks the distance with Him is going to be in Him present at all times, in every place, in all ages. And eternities to come. Choose Christ who died for you and delivered you and you will have your eternal life starting from here, from earth. And you'll enjoy it there forever and ever and evermore. Amen. May the Lord Jesus bless you, protect you and guide you. And I hope um, we learned something from this topic. I hope I wasn't too hard or too harsh and the interpretations, but I ask the Lord Jesus through the intercession of the Queen of Heaven, Mother Mary, to protect you, to bless you, to guide you throughout your journey, your life journey here on earth, uh, so that at the end of this life journey, and I ask the Lord and I pray to Him through the Holy Mother, that it, it's, it's a life journey full of the gifts of God, full of love for, for the Lord Jesus, full of faith, built on the rock, unbreakable, unshakable. I ask the Lord to bring you always in His way, in His path, to show you the way, to teach you the way, to bring you closer and closer, increase your love, increase your faith, increase your obedience for Him, increase your understanding for Him more and more and more, because the more you come close to Christ, the more you're going to love Him the more powerful you're going to see Him. The more we get close to people, the more we realize how weak they are. And they can't do nothing. They can't even save themselves, let alone save me. But when you come close to Christ, you will be rest assured that He is the one and the only one, the mighty God in the flesh,
came in the end of times to deliver you from eternal death and give you through his mercy, through his love, by fulfilling his, God's justice on our behalf to give you eternal life, enjoying it with his heavenly Father by the fellowship of the Holy Spirit for eternities to come. Amen. Let's stand for the Lord's Prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forevermore. Amen. May the Lord Jesus bless you all.